Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, this Sunday evening service. It's sure hard to get you folks in the door. I mean, the sun shines there, and uh, homeschool is a lot of fun. I mean, all the homeschoolers, I mean, spring fever, they're just all in la-la land today. And uh, so we're, we're working on focusing them, but uh, it's just the weather's turning nice, and everybody's just kind of different right now and so anyway that's a good different to have and I'm glad you're here and we're going to start by singing and uh, Brother Dave's going to lead us in a song so find your songbooks and we'll get started right now okay if you'll stand with me turn to page 41 there is a fountain <laughs>
let's have a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on the service tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, I am thankful for each person who's here. And Lord, you know um, how their day went today. You know whether it was an encouraging day, whether it was a discouraging day. And sometimes, Lord, there's people and they feel like they wake up in the morning and they're 10 minutes behind the entire rest of the day. Maybe they felt that way. But I know that you are a God of encouragement and that you have given us your word to help us know that uh, you are in control, to help us know that you set the standard, uh, to help us know that it is worth it to worship you more than anything or anyone else. And so we pray that, uh, that you would help us at this time. This is a great and grave time of prayer for our country, a great and grave time of prayer for our state. And uh, we, w we simply want to do uh, that which is right in your sight. And we want to know, Lord, that uh, we uh, let our voice be known to your glory. And so help us, Lord, as we endeavor to do this and as we endeavor to draw people to yourself. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. And Dave's going to lead you in another song, 468, uh, maybe a little new to some of you.
And you know, getting one doesn't mean you're suddenly committed to it, it just means you're interested in it. And uh, we have plenty of these to pass out. So if you want one, you can look at that, looking there, looking there, and looking there, and just we want to get those to you, and looking there as well. Okay, praise the Lord, and we're grateful for that. And uh, anyway, anybody else okay? And so anyway, let just so you know what's going on, this is uh, three weeks in a row. It'll start on June 29th. And, um, and you go, Pastor, could you have picked a busier week? No, I couldn't have. That's why I picked that one. And uh, anyway, June 29th, and then we'll have one, of course, on the, the week of the 4th, but it's after the 4th. And then one more. Then you skip a week because that gives you time to study for your exam. Ah, oh, it brings back such wonderful memories. Memories of all-nighters, beads of sweat, stress, and uh, you know, can I keep all this from leaking out? Can I put plugs in my ears before exam time? But anyway, and uh, it is actually one credit hour, and these are transferable college credits. And for those of you who have already graduated, once you get to six of these hours, you actually get an advanced diploma. Some of you have already received a diploma from Faith Bible Institute, six more hours, you actually get another one. So anyway, just letting you know, excellent subject, biblical worldview, defining and defending a biblical worldview, how, and how important it is that we do that. Uh, make mention of uh, several other things that are going on here, and, and sometimes schedules at the church are an absolute whirlwind. Um, uh, if you were to go down in the fellowship hall, you'll discover that 162 chairs have suddenly materialized in the fellowship hall. Uh, that doesn't mean we've done much in the way of subtraction. We've only done addition at this point. And uh, anyway, we praise the Lord for that. And those have been donated to the church. The amazing thing is, is they, they all look the same and they act the same. That's an amazing thing for a chair. Uh, we're so used to, to, to mix and match. Oh, look, we have one of these and we have one of these and we have one of those. But these are all more or less the same. And uh, so we're very grateful for that, very grateful for that donation. Uh, many of you know we've already been donated the motorized projector and we now actually have on the schedule uh, when the power is gonna be put in so that we can hang that new projection screen. And so we're looking forward to that as well. And for some of you um, are going with me uh, to what is called a press conference. This is called a faith leaders press conference. You go, Pastor, what is that? Well, it's not a rally with Johnny Spandex and the rubber bands. It's not that, okay? It is not a protest either. But what it is, it's a press conference and a stand where, where um, four uh, fundamental Baptist pastors are going to share their view of what they think about the gridlock uh, down in Salem. And this has been in the works uh, for a little while. Uh, but then it gathered steam very, very quickly. Um, at first, I thought, I thought, well, maybe this will happen on Friday. Another person I was collaborating with says, oh, it'll be a week from Friday. And then I get a call and go, it's the day after tomorrow. So everything moved really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, But uh, many, many preachers that you would know from across our region that are in the state of Oregon are going to be present there. Uh, as well as other groups and other organizations. Uh, we thought it would be kind of a small thing because uh, uh, the pastors in California already warned us. They say as soon as they know it's uh, preachers, they won't, the media won't show up. Well, that's not what is happening right now. Um, uh, the man who kind of got the ball rolling, he had already had a radio interview in Medford uh, yeah, this morning. Uh, has another interview in the Portland market tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow morning another interview in the Salem market. And so because of what is going on in Salem, all eyes appear to be paying very, very close attention. And so we have got caught in the middle of this, but that is why we're doing what we're doing. We want our voice to be known. Uh, we believe in rule of law in the state of Oregon. And uh, when the highest legislative body in the state decides to make and break their own rules that they actually agreed upon only months before, uh, that is something to pay attention to. How many of you would say, that kind of sets a bad example, do you think? You know, or does it say, well, you have to understand we're, we're a state of laws, but the laws are only for the little people. 
And so anyway, we're, we have something to say about that. And we're going to say that. And so anyway, some of you men, you're going with me. We are leaving here at 6.15 in the morning. And you go, oh, that's so early. Well, how would you like to be Pastor Franklin Umber, who's leaving where he is at 4.30 in the morning? Ah, oh, we feel a little bit better now, don't we? And so, and, and of course, the, the number one question of the men going with me is, are we going to get breakfast anymore? That's the number one question. And, uh, you know, we'll do drive through or something like that. We'll figure out something we get there. And uh, there is a special place in Salem, because this is not going to be a long event. It's not going to be as long as our Capital Connection event we have down there. And so there is this interesting little place um, in Kaiser, Oregon, called the In-N-Out Burger. Some people seem to have an interest in that, uh, that establishment. And so we may go and look and see what that's all about. And uh, anyway, those of you going with me, I thank you for it. It is important, and this is why I want you to pray. It is important that enough people show up so that somebody pays attention. And you go, Pastor, does it matter how many people show up? I'll get to that in my message. Does it matter what the result is? I'll get to that in my message. But there's some important things to think about here. It comes down to this. What does God think of us? And what does God think about what we do? And, you know, are we willing to let others know what we really think about things? Especially when it comes to that which is right and good and spiritual. There are a lot of not right things happening. And, um, and so there comes a point where you have to decide when you cannot ignore this. Because if you, if you do ignore the scorpion, that tail is going to swing around and get you. And so we have to look at these things. So we are looking at these things. Okay, what else is going on? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Okay, Saturday we have men's prayer and coffee, ladies' prayer at 9 o'clock, church soul winning at 10 o'clock. And that gets us all the way to the following week. Ladies, happy Mother's Day is coming. And so that'll be on Sunday, and we want to give... Uh, every lady kind of a nice little thing so you can we can say happy mother's day to you um, i am grateful for my mom um, if it wasn't for my mom i would not even exist okay think that through for a little while okay and um and so we have these realities coming up and looking at several other things uh, again men's retreat many of you already know about that again in a couple weeks here just two weeks here two weeks from Wednesday, you could come on Wednesday and that would be not a good idea because you'll be the only one here because the Wednesday service has been moved to Thursday. Uh, but that's gonna be a wonderful day with the Redeeming Grace Trio. And so anyway, making mention of those things. Now, let me say this, let me thank those who were involved in a, in a mailing and stamping crew that got these out and about 270 of these uh, uh, hit the mail um, what day was that again? Yesterday, Tuesday, that was yesterday. Anyway, I've, I've lived a lifetime since then. And uh, anyway, and so these are in the mail for I Love America. We will have posters coming at the same time. And for those of you who received a YouTube video clip, feel free to forward that to whoever you want to, that is fine. And by the way, that is now uh, posted on our Facebook page as well. So letting you know that that is taking place and uh, so anyway, we just have all these different things that are, that are happening. And if you came to be bored, you're in the wrong location. And uh, we're having a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, parents, homeschool parents, we did, with all the unexpected activity, we did shift the field trip one week. It will not be on Friday. It's going to be one week from Friday. So just uh, letting you know that. And Dave, um, well... That's not tonight. There we go. Said the Bible stands. Ready to get everybody standing. But uh, yeah, Dave, I'm going to have you. I'm going to have you come and stand, and you can have everybody else stand. And we're going to sing one more song. Okay, if you'll stand with me, turn to page nine. God can do anything, anything but fail.
Daniel, book Daniel, chapter 3. Wow, it got exciting there. I mean, people were getting so excited with that last song. They began casting hymnals. It was amazing. And uh, around it, listen, there was a far more interesting service. I want to go back nine years ago and see if any of you remember the, the one. It was just such a special. I called it Box Elder Bug Wednesday. Does anybody remember Box Elder Bug Wednesday here? And what it is, is I mean, there were so many box elder bugs that had invaded inside here that the entire Wednesday service was just people slapping, trying to get those bugs. And uh, I looked at that, that I have got to do something about this. I think that was, I was still commuting. And so, you know, I wasn't paying a lot of attention. I would show up on Sunday and then I would show up on Wednesday and I went, oh wow, they're everywhere. We've got to do something about this. This is extremely distracting. Uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel. And we're looking in Daniel chapter 3. We are going to be looking actually at, at much of this chapter tonight. Um, and it's important that we do and there's some very, very important observations I want us to uh, to glean from this some ladies here I think you have kind of um some ladies have a music rehearsal I think you know who you are and um, and that'll take place a little while later uh, but in order for that to take place uh, my wife will need to be rescued at a certain point in time and so right now she does not want to be rescued she actually does not want to be delivered and so anyway Daniel chapter 3 start at verse 1 Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof was six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon and three score cubits. We're talking about approximately 18 inches or a foot and a half talking about 60 cubits or so you're talking about literally a, a statue 90 feet high go pastor how tall is a statue 90 feet high the best way to do it is to step outside and look at the peak of our church building look at the peak of our church building and then approximately double that and that is how tall the statue was and then it was on the flats it was on the plain so it could be seen from a great distance away and it says the breadth was six cubits. So you talk about, it wasn't a big wide statue. It was only nine feet. It's, you'd almost kind of think of it more of as a totem pole than you would, you know, kind of like these big, you know, these big husky burly Roman statues. You know, it wasn't like that. It was just very tall, uh, very thin, but very visible. And so that's important. And it says, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs. Wow, see, they had sheriffs in the Bible, okay? And all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, 
and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. You know what's so interesting about that? You think, okay, you, you've, you've passed a new law in the land. And you know, if you thought it was a really great idea, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that, hey, everybody's just going to want to do that? So why did they have the furnace burning already? Evidently, they didn't think everybody was going to want to do that. Verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as peculiar as this passage seems at the first, it is so very, very important and describes to such a great degree what we are experiencing today. We are experiencing strange laws in a land that is becoming strange to us. And yet, you are God of all, and you have never changed. And because you have never changed, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to look to you, the unchanging God, for guidance on what to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Caleb, could you do me a huge favor? Could you uh, close that door for me? Thank you so much for doing that. In history, there have been laws and dictates that make no sense whatsoever. In fact, this one here is really kind of peculiar. All of a sudden, you've got somebody, they've built a huge statue on a plateau. They have hired a symphony to play music for the statue. They have built a huge hot furnace. I mean, for somebody coming in from out of country, they go, this looks kind of weird to me. In history, there have been laws and dictates that make no sense whatsoever, but... Nevertheless, they stand as the law of the land. It makes no sense for a mother to desire the death of her child. It makes no sense for a person to marry a gender they cannot procreate with. It makes no sense for a boy to want womanhood or a girl to want manhood. All such activity is plainly and openly self-destructive to the human race. You can be sure that if confusion and destruction exist, that the devil is at the core of the movement. The Bible says, For the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. What are the two primary goals of the devil's destruction? Number one, the destruction of the worship of the true God, which is something maybe we see here. Number two, the destruction of man who was made in God's image, which is maybe something we see here and now. Some clamor Believing warfare must be the answer. But sometimes all you can do is stand. And that is what I want to speak about tonight, is when all you can do is stand. I'm going to give you seven things to think about that are coming primarily out of this passage. To continue on, look with me in verse 8. By the way, Dave, you'll like this. Every time I read this and I read... Um, about all the different instruments. I go, okay, at the sound of the cornet, flute, harp. You know, I think about this. I try to put them all in order and have the sound effect that goes with it. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is yet. I'll figure that out. I'm not sure. Uh, no, uh, a psaltery is another stringed instrument, and so I got 
yeah, I haven't got that one totally figured out yet, but when I will, I'll let you know. Okay, <clears throat> so probably a hammer dulcimer, probably something like that, bluegrass, most likely. So, look with me at verse 8, now that we're completely distracted and I distracted you. Wherefore, at the time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Isn't it interesting that every time there's somebody who wants to destroy the Jews, it's always the Chaldeans. You'll remember, you'll get far later in the book of Daniel, and Daniel's going to be the president of everybody who comes near the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans obviously were an anti-Semitic people, and they wanted the Jews destroyed. So, at the time, certain Chaldeans came near, and they accused the Jews. Notice the plurality there. Um, you know, kind of like some lady in Congress did yesterday. So, they spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every, I bet they helped him write it, that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, now you're trying to figure these out in your mind, and dulcimer and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image, and whoso falleth not down and worship it, that he should cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace there are certain jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of babylon see what they're after they're after the leadership shadrach meshach and abednego these men o king have not regarded thee they serve not thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou has set up then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach Meshach and Abednego then they brought these men before the king number one when man's laws and God's laws are in conflict there must be a response there's going to come a time you're not going to be able to sit down with whatever it is I often say one of the great frustrations that has existed in the United States of America that you have watched progressively, uh, many of you over your lifetime, some of you were born into it, so you can't really see it because it was already there. But for those of us who are a little bit aged, you know, more sage-like, um, we remember a time where it wasn't really quite like this. And uh, the reality is... Um, you know, you have this idea, man's law and God's laws are in conflict. So what we saw at first, we just saw the progressive legalization of sin. All of a sudden, things which were illegal or immoral, just systematically, one right after another, became legal, became legal, became legal, became legal. It's the legalizing of sin, which is frankly is irritating and certainly not helpful to a society um, how many of you have now had the experience more and more and more recently that when you're behind a car and the light turns green, that car in front of you does not move? That you've noticed it's happening more and more and more and more. And you go, well, they must be texting. Well, there are some other green reasons why it may not even be texting. And, you know, they just, you know, just kind of forgot to move. And uh, so we're having more of this. But so you see, the legalism of sin, by the way, it never helps a society. It always hurts a society. But you see the tide turning. Now righteousness is becoming illegal. Do you notice that? Where the teachers can no longer tell what they believe. Even though they have First Amendment rights in the public school system, they'll get fired if they tell what they really believe. They call it separation of church and state, but it's actually censorship. It is the muzzling of the masses that is taking place. And so we now see a progression where righteousness is becoming illegal, and that is what is happening in this passage too. Understand this, when man's laws and God's laws are in conflict, there must be a response. And, and you know, there comes a point where you just can't sit forever. There's going to have to be doing something. I mean, you know, we have a song that we sing in the, in the junior church hour. I love it. I'm in, right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. Okay, you know, I like standing up. I like sitting down, I like hurting my back, uh, those type of things. 
But uh, what you have here and what you're dealing with here is all of a sudden you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and they have to decide when to stand and when to sit down or fall down or bow down. So when man's laws and God's laws are in conflict, there must be a response. Let's continue on with this angry king. Uh, by the way, I, I, um, Nebuchadnezzar, there's many different character traits that you discover with him. Uh, megalomaniac is one that comes to mind. Uh, uh, the other is um, um, a little bit hothead, short-fused. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I set up? Now, if ye be ready at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery and dulcimer and all kinds of music ye fall down and worship the image which i have made well but if ye worship not ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace and who is that god that shall deliver you out of my hands not really good for a world leader to shake his fist at god but why am I making mention of this? Observation number two. Man will respond in rage and intimidation when his law is not regarded as superior. Think about this. When you go to somebody and you say, I know you enjoy your laws, but there is a higher law. There is a, you have a thus saith man law, but there is a thus saith the Lord law. And what you'll discover, and some of you have relatives, and you've tried to you know, be kind and loving and share a very positive gospel with them, but when they come into conflict with the reality that there is a law superior to man's law, they don't like it. And they get irritated, and they get red-faced. And that's exactly what is happening here. So don't be surprised when that happens, because it's normal. And we have you know, Nebuchadnezzar as the poster boy of what happens when you offend a person who's made a law. Thirdly, look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Now at first you go, well, what in the world does that mean? Goes, does that mean they were careless? No, that's not what that means at all. What it means, they're saying, we don't have to think about the answer. We already know the answer. And this is very, very important. For those who regard God's word, the decision is easy and immediate. You think about that? For those who regard God's word, the decision's easy. And it's immediate. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to rationalize it. You don't have to cogitate about it. You don't have to pray about it. Because you already know. You know the word of God. You know the law of man. You know the word of God. You know the law of man doesn't agree with the word of God. You know that when the law of man and the law of God fall into conflict, you must obey the law of God. There's no, there's no discussion. There's no decision. There's no committee meeting. There's no Supreme Court decision. There's none of that. You already know the answer. And they knew the answer. And so they said, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar says, we already know what we're going to tell you. And here's what they told him. Number four. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. That's an interesting statement. He will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. It's basically saying one way or another, you're not going to be bothering us anymore. Something's going to happen here. And what it is is this. Number four, God's abilities should never be doubted. You should never ever look and go, God, can you? The answer always is, God, you can. He can. 
Now God, he has his own decision-making process as his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God makes different choices sometimes than we want him to. Because us in our moral and our intellectual superiority, we love to tell God what to do and what we think God should do. Kind of like Peter did to Jesus at that time when he turned around and began to rebuke yeah, God himself. says, be it far from thee to do this thing. To which Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus had to say to him because he was having this kind of man superiority over God complex. Understand this. God's ability should never be doubted. What God is able to do. Now this brings us to verse 18 and verse 18 is key. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And this is the crux of the whole thing. The result is never the issue. Can I say that again? The result is never the issue. Your stand for God is. We're very result-oriented people. And so we go, well, if we do this and this didn't happen, then we wasted our time. No. Because there is somebody more important than everybody in the room. Or in the case of some of us and tomorrow, everybody at the capel. There's somebody more important who's watching the whole thing, and that is God himself. And God is watching you. I want to make a difference. Some of you men are coming with me because you want to make a difference. Will we make a difference? Will we make an earthly di difference? I have no idea. But I do know there's a God watching. And you know what the God's saying? God in heaven is saying, you making a difference is not the issue. Me watching you stand for me is the issue. That is the issue. And that was the issue with them. The result is never the issue. Your stand for God is. Now then this brings us to uh, a rather warm moment. Here it comes. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. I kind of picture, okay, furnace, Nebuchadnezzar. Furnace, Nebuchadnezzar. Furnace, Nebuchadnezzar. Can't tell the difference between the two. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and other flammables. And they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Bound with flammables, by the way. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in his haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. This brings us to this sixth point. No matter what the result, Christ will be with you in the furnace of life. And this is the most important thing. You know, whether it happens to be things are heated up, or it happens to be just the opposite. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here it comes. For thou art with me. And that is the issue. What did Moses say? Moses said, listen, we are not going to go anywhere unless you go with us, is what Moses told Almighty God. Let thy presence go with us. It's not worth even taking a trip. No matter what the result, Christ will be with you in the furnace of life. Uh, it is true, and I, there was a, there was a, a children's musical uh, a few years ago, and it, it talked about, um, it talked about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and it got to the place where they're in the furnace, but they weren't burning up. And, you know, and of course it was kind of 60s, 70s style music probably, and they're just going, it's cool in the furnace. Is what they're saying. And so anyway, I don't know if they wore sunglasses or what they did. But anyway, so we have this reality. Final point. Not in Daniel chapter 3, but in Ephesians chapter 6. Book of Ephesians chapter 6. Very, very interesting statement here that I think we need to take note of. Since very often... We waste a lot of air and a lot of breath trying to fight life. Try to put up our dukes. And we go, Let's, we got to fight wrong. We've got to swing at it. Look at, look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is hard for us to understand. Our battle is never against people. That's kind of hard to understand. But the Bible does say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus, when he came to this earth, his battle wasn't against people either. Never has been. His, his battle was against Satan. Hmm. Okay? His battle wasn't against people. His battle was against Satan. I wonder who our battle is against. Granted, sometimes you'll be convinced that a, that a human being is the devil, but they're not. The devil just has a lot of control over them. The devil has a lot of influence on their lives to steer them the wrong direction. Sometimes in a direction, as we saw in the introduction, that doesn't even make sense on paper why would man want to destroy himself it doesn't even make sense why would man literally want to create literally a situation where nobody on planet earth is producing offspring and if they are they're all corrupting and destroying each other what is that about here we go verse 13 wherefore take unto you the whole armor of god that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, what are those last two words, class? To stand. You spend too much time fighting and not enough time standing when the call is to stand. We stand our ground, and we state our purpose. And we say the truth. It isn't a battle. Because guess what? The truth is the truth is the truth is the truth. Right never becomes wrong. Wrong never becomes right. The truth never becomes a lie. And the lie never becomes the truth. And we state the truth. And it doesn't matter if a hundred million people disagree with you. If God agrees with you. In the heat of the spiritual battle... Standing is enough. And sometimes that is exactly what needs to be done. That is the message. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your word in our hearts. Help us to have perspective. Sometimes we have frustration. And Lord, the frustration is legitimate the Bible says that Lot's righteous soul was vexed by their ungodly their unlawful deeds 
and rightly so. But help us, Lord, in an unrighteous land to still stand and speak truth and speak righteousness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The song is going to be number 223. 223, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. The amazing thing with Almighty God is He always has the right perspective. And that's why it's so important to be close to Him as we go through the times that we do. 223, let's sing together. <laughs> 